Okay. I think we'll start and hopefully people will come in as we uh, as we go along. Uh, so welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Victor. I'm the head of uh, knowledge management and communications at uh, ILRI at the International Livestock Research. You know, and on behalf of uh, ILRI and Venture 37, I'd like to welcome you to the uh, third and final uh, webinar of the, the year that we're going to have. And it's care about climate, you know, animal nutrition can make the difference. Uh, and this is the third in the series this year. We had the first one that focused really on livestock and nutrition and livestock's role as uh, in food security and uh, arresting malnutrition. Uh, and then the second one was on the critical crossroads of animal, human, and environmental health and how do we scale up One Health. Uh, livestock and nutrition. So we've had two, and this one kind of really focuses on the hidden benefits of animal nutrition and how that relates to, to climate change. So the objective of this, uh, of this session is to demonstrate how investing in sustainable livestock development, you know, mainly through animal uh, nutrition and feeds and forages, uh, can help build farmer resilience uh, and adaptation to climate shocks and stressors, while at the same time, uh, leading to the co-benefits of greenhouse gas emission, a uh, mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, here we're going to be highlighting some work from uh, the from the the livestock, uh, uh, you know, CGIR research program on livestock, as well as a joint venture between ILRI and uh, Venture Thirty Seven uh, in East Africa, and really looking at the impact of alliances and how that really creates the sustainable impact that we're looking at. So it's not just research or development, but research development in the private sector and how they're working together. So we're gonna have a quick introduction from uh, Di Harvey, and then we'll be having our lightning talks and then some discussion. Uh, Maddie, could you go to the tech tips really quickly? Uh, great. Uh, and I think everyone knows this after almost two years of uh, Zoom meetings, but. Uh, please, you know, change your name, put your, your name and your, uh, you know, your affiliation where you are into your, uh, into your name there. Uh, also, please make sure uh, that you, you know, introduce yourself into the chat. We will be using chat, so make sure uh, that you put any comments or questions into the chat. If you have a question, uh, to the speakers, you can put that into the chat and then they'll answer you uh, when they're not speaking. Or uh, we can discuss that during the panel discussion. And remember, this session is being recorded. Uh, we won't be having any uh, open mic, so you don't have to worry about that, but just know that it will be uh, recorded and will be put up on uh, into the public and that we will be doing live tweeting. Uh, and you're welcome to tweet about the, about the session as well. Uh, so with that, I would like to hand it over to Dai, uh, who is uh, the technical director for Land Lakes uh, and Venture 37. And he joined Venture 37 in uh, 2004 and is based in Zambia uh, and really works uh, across the board from development research and with a growing focus on private sector involvement in the dairy industry. Uh, so over to you, Dai. Great, thank you very much. And uh, thank you all um, for attending today. Um, delighted to be here um, from, uh, uh, from a, a, dodgy, a dodgy line in Kigali in, in Rwanda. So um, that's where I'm visiting at the moment. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, so today, um, what I'm going to be looking at uh, is at a very high level giving a a bit of a, an overview of some of the um, activities and, and, and some of the, the challenges that have been faced around uh, climate and climate change, highlighting uh, the impact that this has had on having on, 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 on people, and then also looking at the opportunities and what are some of the solutions that we're going to be able to um, possibly look at going forward. Um, sorry, my, my line is getting a bit bad, so I'm going to turn the video off if you don't mind. Um, so at, at the moment, as we, we know, um, we're all well aware that over 75% of production um, across East Africa is from smallholder farmers. And these smallholder farmers are particularly vulnerable to, uh, to climate change. Um, and we'll, we'll have a look at that and, and, and speak, speak a little bit about that. 
we're feeling that opt the, the optimization of animal nutrition is 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 one of the key interventions that, that can go for that can go forward that can help help us to alleviate and mitigate some of the um, some of the effects of climate change by helping to improve productivity and also to um, to to alleviate uh, some of the the potential losses in income um, and also and improve the resiliency of our farmers on the demand end which I think is critical is absolutely Im Im important and really really critical. Um, is that we're seeing an increased demand in animal source foods um, as we go forward. This uh, increased demand in animal source food is, is growing year on year. Um, animal source foods um, in our less developed countries in the world is absolutely essential for the reduction of green, uh, reduction of uh, child uh, malnutrition and, uh, and child stunting. This is really, really important. As we go forward, increasingly important is not only um, the, the importance of any solution must be inclusive. Um, working not only with uh, not only working with the, the, the producers, um, also consumers, but how do private sector research institutes and governments look at um, at some of these solutions to be able to produce food sustainably across the world? Um, next slide, please. So there's been a lot of discussion over the last uh, few years. We've had COP, we've had lots of chat, lots of discussions around how climate change is, is affecting farmers, affecting agriculture and affecting primary production. Um, this is highlighted, we're well aware that the variability in climate is not only a, a challenge, a physical challenge, as we can see from this awful slide here that we can see of massive amounts of land being flooded through Cyclonidae um, and uh, Cyclonidae in Mozambique, which is a, a recent and a massive example. But we're also looking at the variability of, um, of, of, uh, of the climate, which is both drought and also um, drought and, and, also, um, <clears throat> and also floods, uh, storms, and increasingly um, different uh, unseen challenges, which is variability in, in the pricing of inputs um, and also variability um, when it comes to the pricing of outputs as well. All of these are, um, are, are factors which are affecting farmers and are definitely affecting the resiliency of our farmers. Um, at the micro level, um, this is affecting our productivity of our stock um, through heat stress, reduction of, uh, of fertility of our animals and also what is, uh, how does this affect uh, the, the disease burden and the disease challenge? Next slide, next slide, please. So on here, we're having a look and uh, having a look to see this, uh, this data from FAO um, and also from the Paris, uh, Paris Agreement is, is showing us that agriculture is one of the largest emitters. We're well aware of this um, and we're well aware that agriculture, that, that, that livestock is uh, about 14% of the greenhouse gases. Now, what, what that, that acknowledged, and uh, as we can see, different countries have different, um, have different percentages of, of, how much, of how much is being affected by the, um, by, uh, and is the contribution for greenhouse gases. And what we're suggesting or saying is that animal nutrition and optimization of the, of the diet of animals um, through improved, uh, balancing of the diet and also improved feed quality can actually help to reduce uh, the emissions, the intensity of emissions, and also um, as a way of looking at uh, improving the resiliency of, of the farming system. Next slide, please. On, on, on this slide here, we uh, just highlighting uh, very much and we'll, you will be hearing from the other speakers um, later on today in the flash talk, uh, a much more detailed one-on-one uh, -on -one items of what's going on uh, and what's happening across uh, different, different sectors and different areas. Um, and we'd really encourage you to, to, to dig in and to give, give, a, give a bit of discussions. We've identified with ILRI and with the other alliance partners um, that really the fastest way to improve productivity is looking at how can we improve um, animal nutrition and get that um, and get that productivity up as, as quickly as possible. Focusing on, uh, on nutrient dense forages 
um, which are being produced locally for local cows, moving um, local cows and local ruminants, moving them in the direction um, as, as little as possible. Um, so we're not affecting the climate um, anymore by having to move large quantities of food around. In addition to this, is being able to look at the farming system itself and how do we look and improve the post-harvest losses and the storage um, to in, in look at adaptability of the farmers and improve their resiliency. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the potential solutions is uh, something that uh, Ilri, um, Lando Lakes, Corteva, and Forage Genetics International um, had looked at setting up is a, an alliance. This is an alliance model, which is looking at both private sector, um, looking at uh, a research institute uh, like ILRI, and then uh, an NGO, um, an implementing partner like Venture 37, at looking at, a, at, the, at the forage value chain from end to end. Um, there are other alliance partners that are crowded in here. Looking at this alliance model as a potential solution to being able to scale out with, the, uh, with an offtake market there as well, looking to scale out to improve um, the animal nutrition and as a result, improve the productivity and improve the resiliency of the, of, of the, of the households um, going forward. This alliance model will, will have a couple of speakers who will get into a little bit more detail about this. This alliance model has been running now for approximately two years. Um, uh, it's 18 months now in, 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 in Kenya, um, and we'll be um, digging into a little bit more detail of exactly how that works. Um, but this is a potential um, opportunity and a potential model for um, improving that uh, quality of the forage um, at the household level. Next, next slide, please. Preliminary results from the uh, Alliance. It is a, it's a very small pilot model, but there are about 3,500 3, farmers who've been trained and our early signs from the um, improved productivity is over 24% of productivity and with a reduction in the, in the methane intensity of, of uh, the estimated reduction of methane intensity of just under 20%. Um, and the CO2 as well, you can see there, similar um, reduction um, on that side. These are, these are estimated um, figures by, by working this out, but this is, gives you some idea of, uh, of the opportunity when you're looking at balancing a diet and optimizing, um, optimizing a diet um, with, uh, with ruminants. Um, this has been focused really on dairy cattle, but this is something that could also be, could happen uh, across, across the region and across the area. And we feel that this is a, is a potentially innovative and quite a quite a cost-effective way of, of getting sustainable change in our in our agricultural systems and in particular in the production of animal source foods, which we know is so important for um, our for our um, target um, populations and especially targeting that that uh, that child mal malnutrition in the first thousand days of life. Thank you very much um, for that. And uh, I will hand over back to Michael to go through our flash talks, which um, I'm uh, uh, looking very much looking forward to. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Di. Uh, thanks, Di. We have three today after Di's presentation, we have three uh, really interesting presentations, first from Anne and then uh, two from the uh, the alliance to look at uh, different angles of that. So I'd, I'd like to welcome Anne. I think you're going to be speaking directly, Anne, yes? Uh, are you there, Anne? Uh, so I'd like to, to welcome Anne, uh, who is the thematic leader for tropical forages uh, in Africa for the Alliance of uh, Biodiversity International and SEAT of the CGIR, and also worked on the CGIR research program for livestock as well. Uh, so over to you, Anne. Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Today I will be talking about improved forages. 
And the improved forages will thereby be framed as one means of managing the sustainability of the livestock sector, which is indeed a big issue and something that needs to be managed. Allow me to immediately zoom into the greenhouse gas emissions on this slide. And now, how do we deal with um, trying to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions? I think we're all very well aware about people advocating for reducing livestock numbers. Um, and we also do um, see solutions for increasing the efficiency of livestock production. So obviously, or I think at least that this should need not be one or the other, but that we need to work on both pathways. The second big environmental issue associated with livestock production is the land use. To give you a little bit of a, of a picture, uh, planted forages can be far, found on about 159 million hectares, which is almost as much as rice. And the big issue is now that the use of land for feed production actually comes with a big opportunity cost. That same land could also be used for plant-based food production, for carbon storage, for biodiversity conservation. So it is therefore really important that we start thinking carefully about where do we produce the feed. So therefore the mention of spatial targeting there. At the same time, if we use the land for feed production, we better do it in an as efficient or productive way as possible. We do have to do this without compromising the positive contributions of livestock. So it issue, the issue really becomes how to optimize the environmental footprint. And as if all of that was not complex enough, we also have to deal with the impact of climate change on livestock, which can be direct impact for heat stress or indirect impact. Potentially, the biggest indirect impact is, through, is mediated through the impact on feeds and forages. The impact of climate change on feeds and forages will be felt in terms of quantity, quality, as well as composition. The graph on the right is just to illustrate how important grasses are in feed baskets across different systems and different species. And the maps on the bottom show how suitability of two grasses, uh, Napier grass and Brachiaria grass, is likely to change as a result of changing climate. So that is where we now um, propose uh, improved forages and their integration in livestock production systems as a true triple win or a true climate smart intervention. So at the bottom you see a typical situation in a smallholder farming system where during the dry season, there is a reduced feed availability, which uh, results in uh, very low uh, productivity, uh, in some cases to mortality. So by integrating improved forages in your systems, you can actually increase the year round availability of food quantity, of feed quantity, and also that uh, feed is of, of high quality. And if you choose your forage species carefully, you can also make sure that they are adapted to the changing climate. And that is a very good way of increasing livestock productivity. Also, because as you can see on the right hand side there, the better you feed your cows, the less methane you produce per kilogram of milk, you can also reduce the greenhouse gas emission intensity. And at the same time, by uh, choosing high productive forages, you can improve your land productivity. Often also they are well adapted to uh, marginal lands um, of soil for low soil fertility uh, or um, uh, adapted or, or tolerant to, for example, floods. So, this slide, I, I think, summarizes all that in a very beautiful way. Um, so on the left-hand side, you can see a, a picture of an integrated crop livestock farm um, where a variety of, of tropical forages are mixed into the cropping system. They can be on their own uh, pieces of land, but often they can also be integrated in intercropping arrangements or rotations or um, on soil water conservation structures, so, uh, such as terraces, or you often see grass strips. 
Now, these can be fed through the animals, through uh, grazing or through cut and carry systems. And the manure that the animals produce can then be fed back into the forage production. And like that, you have a nicely integrated system. So on the right hand side, you see, um, a, again, a summary of the benefits that this provides in terms of environment. Um, we can expect an improved soil quality. And of course, we also uh, can see the climate benefits, as I said, through reduced greenhouse gas emission intensities, uh, but it can also go through the pathway of incre increased soil organic carbon and carbon sequestration. Um, we can also expect reduced water use and, um, and positive impacts on biodiversity through less pressure on land, but also sometimes through uh, restoration of degraded land. And then, of course, at the bottom, the very important livelihood gains um, in, in the form of healthier and more productive animals, uh, which produce more milk, which can translate into better food and nutrition security or in more income or in a more diversified income. And through the manure, you can also expect some improved crop yields or through reduction in erosion. So in conclusion. So although improved forages really do provide a pathway for sustainable intensification of life, of uh, livestock production, um, we, we, we do see uh, more potential. Having said that, we do also at the same time observe a rapidly increasing demand. One of our private sector partners, for example, reported a 13-fold increase in seed sales next year. So what does that mean in terms of next steps? So I think, first of all, we have to continue creating awareness of improved, improved forages, be it through more traditional extension ways or through digitally enabled tools. And very importantly, we have to continue working on functional feed supply systems, as that is that continues to be one of the important bottlenecks for farmers to actually access affordable, good quality seeds of the forage varieties they would like to implement in their farms. So we need to streamline registration and certification processes and work with the private sector to improve distribution and commercialization of the seeds. On top of that, we have to also continue on our breeding pipeline. As I said, there are always emerging challenges. We've talked about climate change, increased uh, extreme events such as droughts, and also increased uh, pest and disease pressure. So we need to make sure that there is access to well-adapted varieties for our farmers. And as I was also already mentioned, I think we have to start thinking more and more about spatially targeted forage production. So how can we produce forages that are suitable for specific niches in landscapes or in farms. And of course, we also have to work on an enabling policy environment. So thank you. That was all from me today. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Anne. Uh, that was great. And it really does show the kind of triple wins that you're getting from improved uh, uh, feeds and forages, particularly around the environmental benefits and the, the co-benefit of ad, uh, mitigation, uh, looking at the livelihood gains and the productivity gains. That's really great. And, and I think your conclusions really feed into what we'll hear now from the uh, Kenya Nourishing Prosperity Alliance work that they're doing on some aspects of this. Uh, some aspects of this. So I'd like to introduce uh, Reni uh, uh, Chemtai, uh, who is uh, in an agronomy and forage technical expert in working uh, for the Kenya Nourishing Prosperity Alliance. Uh, and she'll be talking on uh, the impact of farmers and their environment from the use of improved forages. Uh, so over to you, uh, Reni. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Reni Chemtai here. Um, going to talk about the KNPA project impact on the farmers. And the, uh, and the environment uh, from the use of the improved forages. Uh, just to talk a little bit on what the project does. 
we are actually training farmers, uh, smallholder farmers uh, targeting mainly women uh, to improve or increase uh, the usage of improved forages to increase their milk production. And uh, on this, we have uh, 16 sites that we're working on and uh, we, we work with these farmers at the site and together with other farmers that we train on these sites on matters to do with the soil health, right from soil testing, land preparation, uh, planting, management, uh, harvesting. Uh, for the harvesting and conservation, we do the test of feeding and then later on balance the ration and feed the animal. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Um, on the how uh, forage uh, uh, affects the climate, you'll find that uh, as a, a cow is fed on good quality forage and enough of it, you find that the cow will eventually improve in production and also uh, these end up lowering the intensity of the methane gas emission. Uh, but the question is why are the smallholders still not there in terms of the uh, good quality forage and availability. Uh, there are many reasons, but I'll uh, focus on main major two. Uh, first, you'll find that um, uh, their farmers will only use what is available. So uh, for example, currently uh, locally farmers can easily access, let's say the low quality hay and maybe a little bit of napier grass and uh, that really limits them because they're not, they're not able to access the good improved uh, forages. Uh, also, there's a problem in supply of inputs, the seeds, as I said, and also maybe the fertilizer equipment, for, for example, such as the uh, forage harvesters. A farmer who decides to plant maize ends up not having the good forage harvester that will produce a good uh, quality forage. Um, another problem or another challenge that you get is uh, there's very little knowledge and information that these farmers have. And uh, right from the agronomist, uh, the agronomy to the feeding of the cow, farmers, most of them don't know that you're supposed to test your soil. And if that is it, they, they also don't know the right type of fertilizer to use for a particular crop or when you're establishing a particular forage. Knowledge on the available quality forages or the improved forages, most of it is very little or even not, not available. And uh, some farmers, when it comes to knowledge, like even establishing some of these forages, especially the forage like Lusan, uh, stage of harvesting such kind of forages, and uh, even being able to balance the rations and feed the dairy cow, it's still a really big issue with the farmers. Next slide, please. Okay, something else we've also seen on the ground is um, from the project, there's a real good uh, decrease in the cost of production. You'll find uh, uh, from what the project is doing right from soil testing to being able to harvest the feed test and balance and feed the cow. Um, there are good yields reported from the variety of forages that we are planting. And uh, from this, a farmer is able to produce a particular kind of forage at a very lower cost, maybe for a kg. And this really helps to curb uh, problems. Uh, for example, buying uh, low quality hay at, uh, let's say around 12 shilling, 20 shillings per kilo right now, and compared to producing, let's say for example, a kilo of sorghum, forage sorghum, uh, forage maize at uh, around two, three shillings per kilo, which is quality. Um, something else you find that um, even through the process that we have, uh, a farmer is able to know what crop or what forage is doing well in the environment and being able to focus on that and also be able to produce as much as it can um, and uh, at a very low cost. I can use a good example of, uh, let's say, the maize silage. The, local, the locally available maize silage in market uh, goes at 12 bob. And if you add transport maybe to the farm level, uh, that will cost around 15 bob. But from the sites, uh, when a farmer gets to plant at their own sites, a kg of um, May silage will go between two, bob, uh, two, two and five shillings, uh, Kenyan shillings, sorry. Uh, next slide, please. 
please. Um, there's uh, improved uh, milk production being recorded on the farm. Uh, from the forages that are being produced in the project, we are able to do testing to be able to know the nutrient content in terms of uh, protein energy uh, using the locally available testing facilities uh, such as the crop nuts and uh, also uh, ilri. Um, we are able to do some feeding trials with the feeds that we've established. And uh, this is done by two, using two to three cows, depending on the availability of the forage on each particular site. And we are able to feed these cows and uh, uh, monitor them uh, in a period of two weeks. And uh, how we do it, we actually use what a farmer has uh, together with what has been established in the project to balance the feed. And uh, this is done by the help of a ruminate tool, especially for the emerging farmers and also the ILRI uh, feed tool for the smallholders farmers. And uh, this has really been able to help us do that. And um, uh, from the data, you're able to see how the production is coming out along. And also still from the data, if you compare the current rations before the, the new ration, the improved one, you you're able to see also the methane gas emission. With improved production, you see the intensity of methane gas emission going down also. Next slide, please. Um, it's also exciting and very encouraging how farmers also get engaged in uh, several activities that we do on the ground. Um, one of the activities we've seen, uh, if you compare now, for example, from the baseline when we began, uh, the average production per cow per day, and currently, uh, now that feed is available in plenty and in good quality, you find that uh, there's good increased production at the farm and uh, the farmers are happy. This you get from the feedback from farmer. I'll quote one of the farmer from whatever uh, she was able to share that uh, since we came on the ground, uh, we, we really came at the right time when she was almost giving up and uh, we were able to work with him, with her, sorry. And uh, currently he sees his production going up and uh, he's, uh, he has begun and he wants to, to go through and get his target, uh, her target of two, 200 kgs to begin with, uh, that is of milk production, which is good. And um, one also farmer gave a good feedback on the improvement on the milk quality, uh, that since he began using uh, Lusan to feed his cattle, uh, his, her wife, who, is, um, who, who runs a coffee shop, the customers were really giving good feedback that uh, the white coffee is, has good taste. And also the, he, he, he has been also having uh, quality issues in terms of density with the cooperative society where he sells his milk. And that has really also stopped from the use of uh, when he began to use uh, these forages. And then uh, also milk consumption has also gone high up. Some communities that we deal with, they really value consuming milk. But since milk at the initial stages was very little, you find it's not enough for the, for the family. And uh, currently they have at least enough and then even can get more to sell. And uh, over time of period, we expect the improvement of the body condition of the animals. That means more animal uh, showing heat signs, uh, having cows per ear, that means more cows and uh, this farmer is able even to get more income by selling excess uh, cows on the farm. Thank you. Excellent, thanks Reni. Uh, so now we'd like to go over to the private sector and we have a, a great uh, presentation to compliment uh, Reni's looking at private sector investment. So uh, I'd like to hand it over to uh, Humphrey uh, Kiroe, uh, who is the country lead for Kenya and the Great Lakes region uh, for Kotova AgriScience and in part of this alliance as well. So over to you, uh, Humphrey. Oh, thank you, Michael. Um, today, I will uh, take you through some um, investment opportunities that are available within the forager space in the country. Um, but to begin with, uh, just to introduce Coteva is an agribusiness company that uh, is involved in the sale of uh, 
uh, farm inputs, up and including forages. Next slide. So um, now this slide, I uh, just want to share with you the uh, overall dairy uh, landscape in Kenya. Uh, is what I'm calling an investor's dashboard. Um, any person wanting to invest in the dairy sector in Kenya um, uh, gets excited when he looks at uh, statistics and data like this. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to highlight is that uh, what makes uh, this sector very attractive to private sector investors? Firstly, is the size of the opportunity. Uh, uh, studies estimate between uh, 1.6 up to $2 billion uh, industry uh, in terms of the milk industry. In Kenya, it contributes to about 6% of the GDP. So it's uh, an emerging sizable. I should also say it's one of the most organized uh, sectors uh, here in Kenya. Um, the other drivers for growth includes uh, the increasing population uh, driving the consumption of milk. Uh, some studies done by USAID in some of their uh, dairy initiatives here in Kenya estimate that by 2050, uh, the demand of milk will be around uh, 12 billion liters. As we speak now, we are almost like in a net deficit state, uh, whereas the demand is about 7 billion, uh, supply is just about 5 billion liters per annum. Um, the other bit is uh, what um, uh, data shows, simulated data shows that uh, the per capita consumption of milk in Kenya is one of the highest in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, there is estimation that by 2050, there will be, you know, the consumption will double from around 110 to uh, 220 liters uh, per person per year. So all these basically um, are signals telling any investor that uh, this is a sector that will continue to thrive. Uh, that said, uh, um, increased milk production obviously comes with uh, an increasing demand to feed the animals. And um, as we speak now, the cost of um, um, uh, production of milk, about 65 to 70%, is attributed to you know, animal feeds. So there's also an, an increasing uh, demand for uh, feed. And obviously, uh, within the Eastern African community and Central Africa, uh, with all these um, um, uh, trading blocks, there's an increased opportunity for exports. Uh, separately, uh, on the right side of the screen um, is just an um, illustration of uh, the dairy value chain diagram. And as you can see, there are many opportunities uh, for any investor that is coming into this segment. Um, there are opportunities ranging from uh, production, uh, where you can set up um, a dairy farm, all the way to marketing and distribution. Uh, there is a growing uh, demand for value-added milk products, um, yogurt, and other byproducts of milk. Um, Kenya has always had an appetite for asking investors to come in and supply dairy uh, uh, equipment and up to including the maintenance of some of those equipments. But what is interesting for a company like Coteva is our contribution as a research and development company. What is our contribution, for example, in the uh, feed space? So uh, we see significant opportunities. And as my the previous speaker mentioned, um, there is an increasing demand for uh, alternative uh, uh, forages and fodder that can supplement the commercial concentrates that are quite pricey and driving the increased cost of feeding. I should also mention that um, the other opportunities that are emerging, uh, and we are seeing them uh, currently in Kenya on training extension and consultancy services, uh, both um, for commercial enterprises, but also smallholders. And that's why um, uh, our contribution to the Kenyan nourishing prosperity comes in. 1.8 million smallholder farmers are involved in uh, milk production in Kenya. And there's some significant knowledge gaps as uh, the previous speakers mentioned. So um, we are already seeing um, companies like Performator, uh, which is a milk dairy consulting company coming in to be able to provide professional consulting services uh, end to end. Next slide. So what, what are some of the challenges that uh, uh, smallholder farmers are facing today? Uh, one of it is um, increased uh, cost of commercial uh, concentrates. And uh, 
That is heavily illustrated on the chart on my right-hand side of the screen. This is a very recent study uh, conducted by an um, Egerton University, Tegemeo Institute and Kenya Dairy Board. They found that in the you know, farming system of zero grazing, at least it confirms um, at least 62% of um, uh, the total production of milk uh, direct costs goes into uh, feed. And um, uh, it starts to reduce as you go into other grazing um, uh, systems like um, uh, semi-zero grazing and open. Um, Kenya being a largely um, zero grazing um, uh, country, except for the northern part where there's a lot of um, um, herding, um, commercial milk production continues to be costly because of the high cost of concentrates. Uh, with the weather challenges um, and varieties of weather that comes in, it's, it's very difficult to maintain uh, a stable year-round production um, access to um, uh, animal feed and most of the forages. So farmers actually will struggle a lot during episodes of drought uh, to access um, feed. And as the previous speaker mentioned also, there's an increasing demand for uh, customized total mix ratios for farms. And that is driving farmers to start to think about supplementing commercial concentrates with um, other forages. Uh, we are seeing an emerging trend of food safety um, and a, a better demand not only for uh, quantity but quality with challenges of aflatoxin and other mycotoxins in milk. Um, it, it, it actually calls for um, a very good quality um, animal feed to make sure that the food safety standards are adhered. So that continues to be a pain point for farmers, but also there's, uh, with climate change, there's need for resilient uh, forages and fodder. So um, we're starting to see trends in Kenya where we are uh, seeing palm millets and, and uh, sorghum uh, silent being produced by farms. For any investor like Coteva, we are looking at, for example, input sales, um, accessing quality uh, planting material and seeds, uh, especially in the forward and forage space, uh, is one of the areas that we are including in our business um, um, plans. And we are already starting to invest in Kenya. Uh, there's also a growing demand for inoculants, especially for uh, farmers that are actually doing um, uh, corn silage and ensiling. And um, also, the, we are seeing some new business models emerging uh, where silage entrepreneurs uh, are coming in to guarantee um, uh, full year production. So they are contracting small scale farmers and dairy enterprises to ensure that they are able to avail them good quality forages. Other opportunities include bailing services uh, and also mechanization services. As the previous speaker mentioned, uh, we are currently struggling with um, the challenges of having good quality machinery, for example, for uh, silage harvesting. Um, we have opportunities for companies like John Deere to invest in this space and many other companies that uh, are involved in that. Uh, some pictures there showing some of the you know, practices uh, in Kenya, people trying to do some uh, uh, ensiling and also a growing demand for um, wrapped silage. Next slide. So, um, as I was looking at the Kenyan landscape, I was trying to look at what are some of the challenges and opportunities that uh, emerge and, and trying to tie that to aspects of uh, uh, climate change. Um, so one of it is uh, the use of adaptive technologies. So um, whereas most of these will revolve around uh, research and development into you know, forages and fodder that have low, for example, methane emissions, uh, that is an opportunity for um, uh, companies that sell input like ourselves to consider. But there's also um, an opportunity, uh, for example, for uh, practices that are integrating soil management, uh, fertility management. We are starting to see uh, some um, uh, forages that are very nitrogen efficient. For example, Coteva sells uh, some um, corn silages that have better efficient use of nitrogen. Uh, in the soil. And also for uh, animal breeders, I'm sure a good size of the panelists are involved in this, uh, there's need also to focus on improved um, um, both indigenous and exotic uh, breeds that uh, reduce um, uh, emissions. Uh, the other area uh, to think about is efficient. 
Could we please, uh, please try to uh, finish up, okay? Yes, so as I wrap up, which is, this is the last slide, is uh, the other opportunities within um, uh, the irrigation space uh, where we can uh, introduce some uh, uh, solar powered irrigation system and other value addition um, uh, opportunities. So um, next slide. Thank you for your attention. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Humphrey. Uh, that's great. Uh, can we uh, please have maybe put all the speakers uh, on? That would be great. Uh, we have about 10 minutes for questions now. Maddie, could you maybe just put everybody's camera on? If every if all the speakers can put their camera on, that would be great. We had a lot of questions and, and I see a great new, uh, a great session that we can do next year really looking at greenhouse gas uh, emissions and mitigation efforts, maybe something around that and even the genetics on, uh, on the genetics of breeding and, and how that affects greenhouse gas emissions. So I think this, there's been a lot of questions, a lot of chat in the, uh, in you know, a lot of discussion in the chat. So we'd like to continue that, uh, but we'll try to ask some questions that came up in the chat and that were, weren't answered uh, to the different speakers. Uh, maybe I could start with uh, Anne and looking at this, you know, greenhouse gas emissions and how we're estimating those. Uh, Anne, did you have some comments or thoughts on that? And could you could explain how how we estimate uh, greenhouse gas emissions and how you're doing that? Sure, I, I'm I'm not super familiar with the project uh, that was um, where this question was uh, directed to, but in general, um, there are a few places in the world where they actually do actual measurements of greenhouse gas emissions. The Mazingira lab at ILRI is one. We do some at the Alliance in, in Colombia, but that is very expensive and you cannot really get um, really data that, uh, that covers wide area. So the general practice is to actually estimate it based on activity data. So how many animals, how much do they eat? What is the quality of the feed? And then use, um, standard equations uh, to estimate um, what this means in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. And the quality of the feed is a big um, uh, factor in those calculations. Excellent. Dai, did you have anything you wanted to add on to that? Um, yeah, just just re-emphasizing re um, the quality of the feed. Uh, the, so that's the the size, the, the chop length of the feed and then the nutrient density within that feed. So in, a, in simplistic terms, the better the quality of the food, the less energy that's required for that animal to, to, to digest it and to, to ruminate it. So just in, in very simple layman terms, that's, uh, that's uh, one of the, the areas which is, which is so important. And that optimization of the diet, again, me, making sure that the animal has got the optimum um, diet is really important. Okay, great. Uh, and again, with this mitigation issue, we, as Anne mentioned about Mazingira and their work in, uh, in Colombia, I think this is something that we'll bring up next year as well and maybe have a special uh, talk to really look at mitigation efforts and some of the science behind that using some of the work that Mazingira and others are doing. So uh, we'll keep that in mind. Uh, so Rennie, I just wanted to talk to you a bit about, we had a, a question uh, from, uh, you know, from some of the some from some of the participants about, you know, what are the the strategies to get farmers to adopt uh, climate resilient technologies, uh, but they might want to prefer growing another crop that they can have more returns uh, and use a uh, you know reuse feed uh, use residues to feed their animals, which increase GHG. So, uh, is there anything here about how you get farmers to adopt a bit more? Uh, and also, how do you get uh, bring gender into this equation? How do you get women more involved? Uh, what are the incentives for them? Uh, okay, um, I'll start with the first question. Uh, most of the time when uh, doing the trainings, we really try as much as possible to bring in the economies uh, issues. Uh, for example, we have to go through uh, together with the farmer, if we select a particular forage that is doing well, 
look at the yields, the costing right from soil testing until this crop was able to be conserved and ready for feeding. And also look at the returns after feeding. What are the expected returns from the cows, the milk produced from the cow, vis-a-vis -vis maybe the other crops that a farmer is intending to grow, uh, especially depending on the particular area where we are. Like if uh, uh, maybe an area is a tea growing zone, uh, or maybe they grow maize uh, maybe for consumption compared to growing maize for feeding uh, cows as fodder or forage. Um, that's what we use, and it, uh, I think it has really worked well. Mm, going to the next question, um, uh, how we bring in the involvement of women. You find uh, dairy, especially for the small scale holders uh, here in Kenya, um, mostly they, it's the, the, the activities, main activities are left for women. They're the ones who do the feeding, they're the ones who, who are doing the milking. They're the ones taking the milk to the market. Um, and if uh, mostly currently when we invite farmers for, for trainings, we really put emphasis like uh, we would love to have uh, women, 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 and really try and explain on the ground why have the women. Though you'll find uh, most men, the, the land belong to the men and everything. But we try and explain how, because if these women are supported and given support from the, the, the men, uh, they're also maybe given incentive, maybe from the, the milk they sell. Uh, you, you, at the end of the day, they get motivated to even feed these cows more. And uh, the, the whole family, at the end of the day, uh, I think it's a win-win situation for everybody. That's what we're using currently. Uh, thanks, Renny. Just really quickly, just one more question to you because it just came up, you know, uh, and uh, what standards are being used uh, in regards to nutrient propile of the feed and how, well, how do you measure forage quality and what standards are being used uh, with regard to the nutrient profile of feed? Could you answer that one quickly? Uh, sorry, just repeat it again. So something, it's more on kind of forage quality. Yes. And how do you measure forage quality and, and what uh, standards are being used with regard to nutrient profile of the feed? Okay, the feeds that uh, we established were able to use uh, the crop nuts lab to be able to test uh, in terms of uh, nutrient quality, in terms of uh, especially things to do with protein uh, quantity, the energy quantity. And uh, when we use the tools to balance, the tool is able to help us like um, uh, before we are able to enter in maybe how many a cow, maybe the number of kg maybe for example of maize silage that a cow needs, we really need to take into account uh, the weight of the cow. We also need to take into account at what stage of production this cow is at, maybe also the age of the cow. Uh, this really helps and all this information is captured in the tool that helps us to balance the feed. And apart from that, the feed also take into account the cost of uh, producing a kg of each fodder of the forage that we're using. Excellent, thank you, uh, Remy. Uh, so with that, maybe to move over to Humphrey really quickly. Uh, one question that came from the, the chat is, someone was interested in the economics of silage uh, entrepreneurs, and have you collected any numbers? Uh, it seems like it would be very bulky or heavy product to transport. Any thoughts on this? Yes, so um, uh, the model that we have leveraged is uh, from uh, Pakistan, who have been very successful uh, in dealing with smallholder farmers. So uh, uh, one of the easiest ways to work with um, uh, hubs and spokes, so um, a commercial farmer will lease, for example, a dairy cooperative, which has so many small scale farmers and producing at scale reduces the uh, cost per unit. And therefore, um, once the cost per unit is reduced, um, uh, transportation is not a big challenge. Uh, for example, in Kenya, we have seen uh, baled uh, corn silage being transported from the Rift Valley to the central part and the landing cost is um, uh, fairly reasonable. Excellent. 
Uh, and just kind of thinking about some of the work that you've been uh, doing in Corteva's kind of portfolio in East Africa, how do you see, uh, you know, uh, the work that you're doing in Kenya applying to any other, you know, other countries in the region? Anything that you could kind of adapt uh, to other countries in the, the, the region and any lessons that you have? First lesson is uh, uh, some of the regulatory uh, barriers around uh, registration of uh, forages. That's a big, big challenge. Um, and uh, we've had to um, um, engage KEFIS, which is the Kenya Plant Health Inspectorate Regulations here, to guide them in terms of protocols that are used for registration of um, either FODA or forages. And I'll give a good example of uh, corn. They didn't have a protocol. We had to leverage some of the protocols from other countries, test for at least two years. And as we speak now, I think we have the first uh, registration protocol for consignment. So that potentially can be uh, an opportunity for other countries. Uh, secondly is the business models, um, uh, working around small scale farmers that have very limited land. The economics of producing in very little land consistently yeah, is a challenge. So working with commercial enterprises that are able to produce these at scale and selling at an affordable price to farmers makes sense rather than just farmers trying to produce in their own small ways. So those are maybe two quick lessons, Michael. Great, that's excellent. And there, you know, Alan Duncan is mentioning something in the chat. He'd like to get those case studies from you. So uh, you could either send that to us and we'll send it on to him. But, you know, again, good exchange here and a lot of, it's good to see a lot of this exchange happening. We're running out of time, but I'd like to ask Anne, this is such an interesting area. Uh, and if others have any comments too, I'd be happy to hear from them if they want to jump in. But, you know, this is such an interesting area. And Forages, feeds and forages, I mean, have been worked on for 20, 30 years, and they seem to be coming to the fore. But what's the tipping point? You know, how do we how do we get policy development? And what are some of the policy and institutional incentives that can really have this scale up? We've heard about the promise of, you know, uh, feeds and forages for years and years. Uh, how do we really support that through policies and institutions? Any thoughts? Well, I think Humphrey already pointed to an important one. So it's this uh, streamlining of registration and certification and, and making sure there is access to good seeds for planting material. Um, and I think also it, there is probably really um, space for a closer interaction between the policy and the researcher so that there is, there is true um, evidence-based investment because in the end it boils down to investment and it can be um, as, we, as I said somewhere in the chat, in the end, the, the forage demand is driven by a uh, more vibrant livestock demand if it's in the dairy market. So it has to make economic sense for the farmers. So I think that is what is driving it currently, definitely in Kenya. So there needs to be uh, investment in terms of access to markets, access to finances, and then of course also Really, um, I still believe that um, forages is quite uh, knowledge intensive. So there is also a continued uh, need to, to provide knowledge, to gather, compile knowledge, uh, invest in, in, in extension um, and make sure that farmers are well equipped, not only financially, but also in terms of knowledge of these, these technologies. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think with that, unfortunately, we're going to have to end. This was a great conversation. There was a lot of interesting discussions in the chat as well. Uh, but I'd like to hand it off to uh, uh, Dr. Sabonsi uh, Moyo, who's the Deputy Director General for Research and Development uh, at ILRI, uh, particularly for livestock genetics and feeds and forages uh, here. So uh, Bunny will uh, close us off. Uh, please over to you, Bunny. Uh, thank you so much, Michael, and good afternoon, good morning, everyone from wherever you're connecting from. I'm aware that we are on the hour, but I really would like to give special thanks to you all for participating today, and uh, special thanks to our panelists. Uh, you could see from the uh, you know, engagement in the chat that this is an interesting topic. So we thank you all for your contributions and presentation today. In the last one hour, we were reminded about the impacts of climate change to agriculture. 
and that animal nutrition can make a difference and that it is a key factor in improving productivity. We also heard about examples from the field uh, and how we're working closely with many partners in the dairy sector in East Africa, which was the focus. Colleagues, I just wish to highlight, while least we are on the hour, just a few points that we could take home. Uh, this webinar highlighted the partnership that ILRI and Lendolex Venture 37, together with partners in East Africa, has been working on the Nourishing Prosperity Alliance. I hope this was uh, useful to you all as it demonstrated that the solutions must be inclusive. We work with uh, all inclusive partners from producers, private sector, research institutions, governments, and funders. The second point I wanted to bring is that um, access to nutrient dense climate adaptive forages enables a lower cost of production. It increases resilience of producers and also increases the quantity and quality of livestock uh, derived foods. Improved forages also offer opportunities for mitigating greenhouse gas emissions while boosting nutrition security and livelihoods of the communities in a changing climate. I also want to highlight lastly that environmental sustainable and also profitable livestock farming is a powerful option for helping a significant portion of the world's most vulnerable communities find a way to better health and a better life. Uh, coming from the research organization, I will not close, but I, not, I would like to introduce to you Masingira Center. Masingira is the Swahili word for environment. This is a unique state-of-the-art facility here in Ilri, based in Nairobi, Kenya. The center, together with many other partners undertakes research on measurement of the impact of livestock of, on the environment, including for direct measurement of greenhouse gas emissions from livestock. This is key in order to deliver improved agricultural pathways that reduce environmental footprint of smallholder systems. Please visit our website to hear more or know more about a Masingira Center. As we close today, I wish to take this opportunity to thank Venture 37 and all other partners who have worked with us in this field. And we want to specially express our appreciation to our funders who have supported this work. And special thanks to the organizers from the ILRI side led by Michael Victor, who is here, and also from the Venture 37 team led by Madi and Dai Harvey. And again, thank, great thanks to you all. I hope that this was a beneficial time for you. We've already picked up ideas for our next webinar. So see you then. So thanks and over to you, Michael. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Bunny. And again, this was a really interesting one. I love seeing a lot of the, the conversations going on. Uh, again, I'd like to thank uh, Maddie, Maddie from Venture 37 as well for really driving a lot of this forward over the last eight months. It's been a great partnership and we are looking forward to continuing it as well. And yeah, just really quickly, two minutes if you or one minute, if you have any ideas or good suggestions for webinars next year uh, for this, you know, uh, Venture 37 and ILRI led kind of webinar series focused on you know, the benefits of livestock to development and really looking at it from uh, the on the ground perspective. Just put them in the chat right now, spend 20 seconds and any topics, issues that you think we should tackle. Uh, it would be great to get your inputs in and we'll probably send out a evaluation as well. So uh, we can get some inputs from there. But any, any comments or thoughts you have, do please put in the chat and we'll take them up in the new year. Uh, so with that, I would like to thank everybody for joining. Uh, and, and again, we hope to see all of you in the new year when we have new topics and new issues to, to, to tackle. Thank you very much.